Hello! Bienvenidos to topic four, which is all about ecology. What is ecology, you ask? Well, specifically, ecology is the branch of biology that deals with the relationships of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. So you will come in contact with a number of terms and concepts related to this rad idea. I'm guessing that you learned about some of these concepts in previous science classes. The subject of ecology is filled with drama and has all the makings of a Planet Earth documentary. Here are some terms that you will come across. Producer, consumer, predator, prey, herbivore, carnivore, omnivore, detritivore, scavenger, autotroph, heterotroph, saprotroph, species, population, community, ecosystem, biotic, abiotic, it goes on. Our first topic is all about species, communities, and ecosystems. This is topic 4.1. The essential idea is the continued survival of living organisms, including humans, depends on sustainable communities. We will talk more about sustainability later, but let's jump into the material. As we have previously learned, scientists organize and classify organisms based on their genetic, physical, and behavioral characteristics. Biologists have a specific idea of for what a species is, which is called the biological species concept. According to this, species are groups of organisms that can potentially interbreed to produce fertile, viable offspring. What this means is that the offspring of two organisms of the same species need to be able to reproduce. This is being fertile, and viable simply means being able to survive. The idea of potentially interbreeding simply means that if they're located in the same place, theoretically, they could interbreed. Take, for example, the lion that you see in the picture. Let's say this bloke here lives in Botswana in his population of lions. A population is a group of organisms of the same species living in a specific geographical area. If he were to be taken by plane to West Africa and placed with a female lion in a different population, then according to the biological species concept, these two could breed and produce incredibly cute lion cubs. They were simply reproductively isolated from each other, but they were still a part of the same species. However, in order to know this, scientists have to gather loads of information about an organism, their genetics. So this is the limitation to the concept, as some species may not have enough information gathered to know if they are of the same species. Until there's sufficient evidence, sometimes species are not categorized as the same. Sometimes, two distinct species are so closely related to be able to reproduce and produce viable offspring, but not fertile offspring. These offspring are sterile. There are a few examples of this, some of which I know that you know. One example is when a male lion is mated, usually artificially with a female tiger. The offspring is a hybrid known as a liger. It contains characteristics from both parents, but cannot reproduce. So it's not its own species. Another well-known example is a horse and a donkey mating, producing a mule. Let's explore all of these terms and definitions further. You have to get your terms straight. If you don't, you will end up confused and trying to make sense of everything. So let's look at the following terms and what they mean. Species, population, community, habitat, ecosystem, and ecology. First, a species. We just went through this, but in the image you can see we have four species. The octopus, seahorse, shark, and crab. They are different from each other. Next, we have a population. To repeat, a population is a group of organisms of the same species that are living in the same area at the same time. If a species lives somewhere else, then it is not a part of the population. In our image, we have populations of four species, as each of the same species are found in the same area. This leads us to our community. A community is a group of populations living together and interacting with each other within that given area. In our image, you can see a community is all four populations of octopus, seahorses, sharks, and crabs. They are interacting with each other in that given area, which would be the ocean. The habitat is that given area. It's the environment where the species normally lives, and it contains all of the non-living factors, which we call abiotic, in that area. Notice that in the image, there are no living parts. There's simply a sandcastle and some artificial coral-looking thing, which is not living. Repeat, it's not living. The habitat is only abiotic or non-living factors. In our example here, the habitat is the ocean, or more likely an aquarium. Lastly, we have the full ecosystem. The ecosystem is the combination of all of the living and non-living parts. So if we had an equation, it would be the community plus the habitat, the biotic factors, which are the living factors, plus the abiotic factors, which are the non-living factors. And then finally, ecology is the study of these ecosystems and the relationships between biotic factors and abiotic factors. Good, now that we all have those terms straight, let's get a few other things straight. Every single living organism has to eat, no exceptions. 
nada. So how do living organisms obtain their energy? The simple answer comes down to two ways. Either they make the energy themselves, or they obtain their energy from other living organisms. Organisms that make their own food from inorganic, which are non-living things, are called autotrophs. Breaking down this word, auto means self and troph means nourishing. So these organisms are self-nourishing and produce their own food. We have two types of autotrophs. One type are the photoautotrophs that use the sun and undergo a process of photosynthesis. The vast majority of autotrophs are photoautotrophs. The other type are called chemoautotrophs, and they use chemicals to produce their own food. As you can imagine, chemoautotrophs are present in places where there is not sunlight. So think of places like caves or deep dark bottom of the oceans. You can see in the picture the flowering plant, which is the photoautotroph, and the sulfur vent at the bottom of the ocean where chemoautotrophs likely live. We also know autotrophs as producers. If autotrophs are self-nourishing, then heterotrophs are the opposite and have to consume organic materials. They're not able to make their own organic food from inorganic materials. These organisms that feed on organic matter can be classified based on how they feed and specifically obtain these materials. We can classify them as consumers, detritivores, and saprotrophs. Consumers, which you're most familiar with, include herbivores, which feed on producers, carnivores, which feed on other consumers, and scavengers, which feed on recently dead consumers. There are also omnivores, which sometimes are herbivores and other times are carnivores. The second group of heterotrophs are the detritivores, which feed on non-living organic matter. Examples of these are earthworms and wood lice, which is what you see in the picture. Both of these eat detritus, which is dead organic matter, soil, and fecal material. They gain nourishment and they release their waste, which contains high amounts and high concentrations of nutrients. The last group of heterotrophs are the saprotrophs. These organisms feed on organic matter by secreting digestive enzymes that break down the material and then they absorb the products. Sounds pretty gross. And this is how fungi, mushrooms and yeast, as well as bacteria, consume their food. Additionally, there are some super special organisms, mainly unicellular, that are called mixotrophs. As the name implies, these guys are both autotroph and heterotrophs, depending on which condition is present and which is more efficient for them to use. You should be able to classify organisms based on these modes of nutritional intake. Let's look again at autotrophs. Autotrophs make their own organic molecules from inorganic molecules. Most do this through photosynthesis, and some use chemosynthesis. All organisms require nutrients to live. A nutrient is any substance that is required in order to carry out the processes to live. There are five major nutrients that we should know. Carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus. Nutrients enter these systems because producers are able to use the air, soil, and water in order to bring these elements in and create organic molecules. Nitrogen and phosphorus come from the soil. Carbon comes mainly from the air, and hydrogen and oxygen come from the air and water. To break down the diagram for you, the sun is the main source of all energy for this process. Autotrophs then make their own organic molecules molecules and gather the nutrients they need. Heterotrophs consume autotrophs and use those nutrients to make their own organic molecules. Ultimately, these nutrients get recycled when an organism dies or gives off waste products and is broken down by detritivores, and then the plants are able to use those resources again. Pretty rad. Let's move to the heterotroph side. First, we have the consumers. We've already talked about the herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. You can see some examples here. Scavengers are a special group of consumers and feast on recently died organisms. The second group are detritivores, or detritivores, depending on how you want to pronounce it. The feeding behavior of these guys is they ingest detritus, or humus, and their bodies take the organic materials they need, and they poop out the rest, which is broken down and can be used again. Essentially, these guys, like the crab, snail, and millipede you see in the picture, are the recycling team. The last group are the saprotrophs. These are probably the weirdest in my opinion, as they secrete digestive enzymes, which break down their food source, and then they absorb the nutrients they need. It's like if humans were saprotrophs, we threw up our stomach acids, enzymes, and bile on whatever we wanted to eat, waited while it broke down, and then drank it up like a smoothie. Gross and mega gross. Three examples of saprotrophs are mushrooms, bacteria, and mold. As I mentioned before, chemical elements, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, hydrogen, are recycled, and the supply of inorganic nutrients on Earth is finite. New elements cannot simply be created, and so are in limited supply. Hence, chemical elements are constantly recycled after they are used. For instance, autotrophs obtain inorganic nutrients 
from the air, water, and soil and convert them into organic compounds. Heterotrophs come along and ingest these organic compounds and use them for growth and respiration, releasing inorganic byproducts, for example, waste and feces. When organisms die, saprotrophs and detritivores decompose the remains and free inorganic molecules and materials into the soil. The return of inorganic nutrients to the soil ensures the continual supply of raw materials for the autotrophs, which have specialized parts like roots to help the intake of these nutrients. In this way, nutrients are flowing between the biotic and abiotic parts of the ecosystem. This recycling enables ecosystems to be stable for a very long time. This does assume that the nutrients are being used by organisms in a sustainable manner. Sustainability is how biological systems remain diverse and productive over time. There are three main components required for sustainability in an ecosystem. The first is energy availability. So light from the sun provides the initial energy source for almost all of the communities. Second, nutrients need to be available. You have to have the nutrients in order for them or the organisms to get them. Saprotrophic decomposers ensure the constant recycling of inorganic nutrients within an environment. Lastly, recycling of waste. Certain bacteria can detoxify harmful waste byproducts. This also gets the nutrients back into a place they can be utilized again. Unsustainable practices upset this balance and can lead to an ecosystem failing. An example of an unsustainable practice is overharvesting trees like deforestation. This takes many autotrophs away from the ecosystem and the nutrients will no longer be available for heterotrophs. One example of a small scale ecosystem is a mesocosm. A mesocosm is an enclosed environment or pretty much enclosed environment that allows a small part of the natural environment to be observed under controlled conditions. There are three essential requirements for setting up these mini ecosystems. First is having a good foundation, making sure you have the right substrates like pebbles, gravel, and sand, along with a layer of activated charcoal. This prevents mold and helps to aerate the soil. You could then use some moss or a coffee filter to create a barrier between the lower layers and soil. The final layer of the foundation is the pre-moistened growing medium, something like a potting mix. Second, you have to get the right kind of plants. Choosing plants that are both slow growing and thrive in a bit of humidity, most ferns or moss, inspect the plant. You don't want it to have disease or insects before you put it in a terrarium. It's not gonna be perfect and some organisms are too small for you to see. Lastly, you have to maintain appropriate conditions for the mesocosm. Proper amount of light, good constant temperature, and the right initial humidity. Sometimes, occasionally, Occasional pruning may be required if you're able to access. There are three examples of mesocosms that you might be aware of and that you can see here. One example at the top is the glass or plastic terrarium. Another type is the aquatic system that you see on the left. And you can see that this is a research station that has many mesocosms that are being studied. Lastly, at the bottom right, you can see Biosphere 2, which was a large scale, 100% sealed off ecosystem, which contained humans for a time. It was a pretty awesome experiment and and I suggest you read more about it if you're interested. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. We will be spending part of a class period making our own mesocosm so you'll be able to learn more and select your plants for your group. This is a required skill and lab for the IB. The last skill you need to know is how to perform a chi-squared analysis. I won't go into the details now, but what I will tell you is an overview. We will be conducting an experiment to perform this analysis. A chi-squared test can be applied to data generated from what's known as quadrat sampling to determine if there's a statistically significant association between the distribution of two species. Quadrat is this rectangular frame, which is kind of like a square or it is a square and can be used to establish population densities. The number of individuals of a given species is either counted or estimated via percentage coverage. The sampling process is repeated many times in order to gain a representative data set. Notice in the picture the guy is counting crabs and determining how many crabs are in the area that he is sampling. A researcher will randomly determine, whether by computer or throwing at random, the quadrat into areas that will be measured. You can see a couple of sampling distributions on the bottom right. Usually, these are determined by some computer program. There's a lot more to a chi-squared analysis, like the statistical analysis and how that's conducted, to know if the data you're gathering is significant. But in summary, this is used by scientists to determine the relationship and impact of one population of species in an organism on another population of species in that same ecosystem. So as this topic is all about ecosystems, we have to study in ecology the relationship. So chi-squared analysis is a perfect statistical tool to use.
As always, it's really important to give credit where it's due. While the presentation, script, and video are solely of my own creation, many of the images and information contained in the presentation are not, so shout outs to the following. Most of the images and video clips come from IB Bio Ninja and some of the information that's used. Other images and info come from Bionology, iBiology, and Biology for Life. Lastly, some information was gleaned from the Cambridge edition of the IB Biology text as the intended purpose of this presentation is to provide you with yet another resource tool to enhance your learning for the IB Biology curriculum. So keep yourself educated.